Well, hello everyone. I want to welcome you to our Young Investigators webinar series sponsored by the Westchester Biotech Project. We are a fairly new organization. We just launched in the spring of 2017 and are putting together some really wonderful programs that are really about bringing together researchers, engineers, and data scientists in the context of our entire biotech cluster in order to enhance biomedical research. Um, these are some of the different programs that we have going on, and they're all developed through conversation with our community. I'm not gonna go into detail about these, but it will give you a sense of what we're about, and we'll be very happy to talk to you in, at length about any of them. My name is Joanne Gear, and I'm the executive director. Uh, I'm going to mention our partner and co-founder, Michael Welling, who is also uh, with us today. And I cannot go further without thanking our community partners. These are organizations, companies, universities that are helping us to make these programs possible for you. This is the Westchester Biotech Project Young Investigator Webinar Series on Effective Communication in Biomedical Research. Uh, this session is all about presenting scientific information and discovery to the public. Uh, one of the programs that my organization runs is called uh, Young Investigators, and Doreen is the, Dr. Doreen Bodeka is the uh, chair of that organization. Doreen, I'm going to hand it over to you and let you introduce your programs, anything you'd like to say, and then you can introduce Laura. You can just... All right, guys. Um, so, Joanne, thank you very much for organizing this. And Laura, thank you so much for uh, being on board with this. It's, it's really amazing for you to be on board. And I'm really looking forward to your talk today. Um, about me, I, I, when I've been really interested um, since, I, uh, since the third year of my PhD, where was a time where I was getting into the phase of um, getting ready to submit my first uh, first author paper and also trying to look into what are different career paths where I could uh, follow and take my PhD. Um, and since that, I think it was back in 2013, I've been interested in looking into um, helping my fellow PhD students uh, and now current PhD students and postdoctoral fellows with career development. And one of the key things and the key themes that always comes up is communication. Um, irrespective of what uh, field we want to pursue, uh, whether it is being a faculty or a, a, a research faculty or join a teaching school or, or join industry, we have to have skills in communicating science. And I was super impressed when I saw Laura's uh, TEDx talk. And she's, that TEDx talk was, was amazing. And uh, that's, that was what propelled me to get in touch with Laura. And, um, and what was even more interesting when I started looking into her profile is that um, she was a, she did two postdocs, and after that she moved into this unique position where she is um, working with the um, at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, and she works with the uh, scientific researchers, the scientific staff, and with the donor engagement team. And she she tries to match the scientific stories um, to the audiences, and just it's it's again about uh, telling captivating stories. So uh, Laura, I can I'm super excited again, and I can't wait for you to start your talk. So I'm. I am ready for it, and I'm going to mute myself now, and the platform is all yours. And thanks again for being here. Uh, thanks, Doreen, for that intro. Uh, Joanne, do you want to share screens? Yes. Great. So welcome, everybody. Uh, today, uh, just the two things I'd really like to accomplish are, one, tell you a little bit more about the type of role that I have here at Fred Hutch, and hopefully offer a few tips and tricks about how to get started in effective science communication for a variety of different types of audiences. Now, most of you, uh, we notice, don't have microphones, so if you do have questions along the way, feel free to enter them in the chat box. Dorian and Joanne uh, will be moderating. And one of the things I'd really like to start off with is just learning where everybody's coming from. Um, 
what kind of work are you in? Are you in life sciences? Are you in engineering? And what kind of level are you at? Um, today, I really hope to, uh, to discuss how scientists speak with other scientists, but I think a lot of these tips and tricks will apply to everybody exploring careers and any kind of audience that you might need to interact with at some point. So a little bit about me and how I got started in this. So I've been a nerd from day one, and I've been a really ambitious nerd at that. So I think my first science fair was probably at the age of five, and uh, I just kept going from there. And what I'd like to do is tell you that first story about how I got hooked on science research. And while I'm telling the story, I'd really like you to think of your own story. What was that light bulb moment where everything clicked in and you knew that you were going to be in science research? So for me, it started with a high school teacher. And she was going back to school to get her master's degree. And so we got to tag along with some of her laboratory exercises. And one of those days, we went to a biotech company, a local company, and we did a DNA extraction. So I'm probably dating myself here. But it was really, really outstanding to go and do a DNA extraction um, and then run a gel elect electrophoresis. And I remember sitting there looking at my first pool of DNA in my first Eppendorf tube and looking at my hand. And we'd read about DNA for so many days. And here I was holding it in my hand. And I was looking at, looking at the skin uh, that was on the hand and connecting the dots. And I just thought it was so profound that I was seeing DNA uh, in the flesh. And from that moment on it was really when I decided that I was dedicated to science research and I just wanted to study and look at things that you couldn't see with the naked eye. So that's how I got started. That was my light bulb moment. But what I'd really like for all of you is to kind of put that in the back of your mind, like what was that first super exciting thing uh, that clicked for you? Now, uh, as Doreen and Joanna mentioned, you know, science communication is a part of everything that we do as scientists. and. Uh, one thing that um, I'll get to in a little bit is that Fred Hutch uh, identified this quite early on, and I'm in a unique role uh, to Fred Hutch uh, working in science communication. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I got to be involved in and in find this role. So like I said, I was, I was pretty much uh, a big science nerd from day on, uh, for day one. And uh, the thing is, Everything excited me, and I didn't know what it was that I wanted to dedicate my life to. And so I started looking for that one protein, that one folding event that I would dedicate my life. And I, I didn't know where that was, so I tried plant biology. I uh, didn't like that. I worked in evolutionary biology, developmental biology, virology, microbiology, parasitology, you name it. Uh, and then I found myself in infectious diseases and oncology. So I've even, um, I've even worked at biotech firms, universities, and nonprofits. And, and although I never found that one protein folding event that I was going to study for the rest of my life, what I found along the way is that I'm excited by everything science, and I'm excited about the story. And every single incident that takes place in all of our daily lives, in our research lab, every minor event has a really fantastic story behind it. And I wanted to help people tell those tales. And it just depends on how you approach telling that science story. So during my graduate studies, this is where the storytelling really started to click for me. And it was really born out of an incredibly frustrating time uh, early on in my graduate work where I was trying to knock out this one gene out of this one strain of bacteria, and it wasn't working. But I had to go to regular seminars and regular lab meetings and continually present full-length seminars about this project that just wasn't getting off the ground. So I started injecting a bit of humor into it and personifying the different characters because when I gave them a little background story and personalities, it actually gave me a lot more time uh, to fill the full-length seminar. And I found that uh, that's really 
that's how I started to connect with creative science communication. And, and I sometimes get in trouble with faculty here, but I like to anthropomorphize my, my proteins or my bacteria and give them little backstories. And it, it helps me tell the tale and relate to them, but then also help others relate to the story. And so I feel like my, my knack is really in communicating these complex ideas to lay audiences. And now where I'm doing this is at uh, Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington, US. And uh, like I said, my job is quite unique. And I'd like to just take a couple of minutes and explain some of the different roles that I have within this job. So Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center is a nonprofit. Uh, as our name uh, suggests, we study cancer, uh, but we also study all other aspects of health and related diseases. So we have um, uh, and a huge department working on virology, vaccine development, and then also probably uh, one of the nation's oldest public health um, groups as well. And Fred Hutch has a really great story, and I don't know how much of drinking the Kool-Aid this is, but uh, I'd like to share just a little bit about how Fred Hutch got started. And we like to think we're one of the best kept secrets in the Pacific Northwest. So Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Research Center is uh, named after a famous local baseball player, Fred Hutchinson, uh, who was diagnosed with lung cancer. And his brother was an oncologist. and created this institute to dedicate, uh, to dedicate a center for finding solutions for hard to treat cancers. Now, one of our landmark accomplishments at Fred Hutch was the pioneering of the bone marrow transplant. I think a lot of groups around the world had been working at finding a way uh, to develop a bone marrow transplant and had been unsuccessful. And so the enthusiasm for that really dropped off. And there were a few strongholds left, and Fred Hutch uh, was one of those strongholds. And our original team here uh, developed the bone marrow transplant, and they demonstrated the first definitive and um, replicable ex example of the immune system being able to cure cancer. And so this, the culture here really prides ourselves on innovative and boundary-pushing science. And, some of those original team members are actually still here at Fred Hutch. And so it's, it's really inspirational and really great to be around some of these personalities and to still feel like you're part of that original enthusiasm. So to move forward from this, uh, something that was identified here quite early on was this need to get our name out there and communicate our science. And, as most of you will know, being a scientist, uh, a big part of that is being able to communicate what you do, whether it's communicating to your colleagues to generate new ideas, to write grants, to publish papers, or even to go out and educate the community. Uh, you know, there's, there's all these essential aspects of communication that we need to participate in as scientists. And for us, being a nonprofit, Communicating that science is really important for us in how we generate private support to support a lot of our innovative projects and programs here. Uh, so in my current role, I work in a job that's called scientific programming. And this is on the events team within our philanthropy department. And for example, when we have a public facing event, uh, like we want a fundraiser and the audience are really supportive of breast cancer research, my role is to go and curate those science stories and find faculty members or scientists that work in breast cancer and match their stories with our audience's interest. And to do that, uh, I work with them quite closely to develop their presentation skills. So how are they talking about their science? What kind of analogies are they using? And then also what kind of graphics are they using to tell that story? We kind of touch all the bases uh, and making sure that on the day that the right things are being said to the right people. Now, the types of uh, individual uh, projects um, cover a lot of different, um, a lot of different types of tools. So, like I said, we have our oral presentations. So, part of my role is to help script our leadership and our scientists. Uh, I also do 
uh, written uh, science communication. So uh, we have our frontline fundraisers that are going out and trying to drum up support for our research. They don't necessarily have a science background. So one of the things I do is create uh, like a cheat sheet for our non-science fundraisers uh, to learn a little bit about the background biology to give them the tools and a little bit of platform to feel comfortable talking about the science out in the community. A really fun thing that I've gotten to do is uh, help create hands-on experiences for a lot of our signature events. So uh, we really like to educate our, our guests and our donors. And one thing that we're finding uh, recently with a lot of our benefactors is that they want to feel a lot more connected with the science. So when we have these events and these gatherings, we like to create a hands-on experience for them where they feel like they're getting a little personal with the science, but they get to do something one-on-one -on -one and uh, you know, try their luck with pipetting or you know, whatever project it is that we're working on. Uh, and the last part of my role is graphic design. So sometimes scientists aren't always the best at choosing the right graphics to go along with their stories. So one of my jobs is to work with our faculty to develop graphics that are representative of their work but are also approachable and engaging to a lay audience. So at the end of the day, my, my major um, target audience is a lay audience, but that can mean a lot of things. Uh, and I like to call them a non-science literate audience rather than a lay audience, because the people that we're interacting with are very intelligent and very accomplished in their own right. Unlike us, they didn't spend 30 years at a bench dedicating themselves to some finite scientific topic. So different types of lay audiences that we could interact with on any given day are people from the general public. Uh, we do work with our benefactors, so these are usually accomplished uh, business leaders in the community. We work and interact with patient groups business investors, and also our board of trustees who offer strategic leadership to the institute. And every single one of these audiences needs their science story tailored in a specific way that meets their needs. So one of the things that I also get to do in my role is help procure the next generation of science speakers and make sure that our postdocs and our scientific staff are getting the practice and the experience that they need so that a year or two or three down the road when we have a major event that they're going to be ready uh, to go to the big show, so to say. And a lot of this is done over coffee chats. And when I'm interacting with our scientists, one of the things I'm looking for is how are they communicating their science? How are they talking to me about it? Where is their passion? And I, and I want to identify um, that light bulb moment for them. How did they first get started? And I also like to help them identify what type of jargon words they might be using. Uh, so I just want to pause for a minute. And if there are any questions or if anybody wanted to chip in, uh, please go ahead and post those. I can't see them, so Doreen or Joanne, uh, you can you can chime in if there's anything you wanted to butt in with. Um, and I guess I'll keep going. So, <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> thank you. That's a great uh, uh, <laughs> praises about what it is that you do. And I think it's really helpful to imagine that the the communication piece in anyone's career is much more important than we want to think it is. Of course, if we do wonderful work, you know, it should communicate for itself. But the fact is that everything we do is with other people. And even if we're looking for collaborators or, in your case, you know, wanting the public to understand what you're doing and so on, it really is key. So thank you for getting us started that way. Doreen, did you um, want to no, take no, we, uh, Yeah, um, so I see some of the attendees are postdocs, and I was wondering if, um, you can talk a little bit about how, uh, because you're in the introductory phase, how your postdoc experience, um, how did you land in this position, or rather, um, well, to, to put it straight, uh, did, would you want to do your postdoc again, or did you wish you had directly moved into medical communication? Was your postdoc experience helpful? 
uh, or is it helpful now when you communicate with the scientists because they think they, they know that you've been a postdoctoral researcher and that gives you a better edge in getting their attention maybe so just if you can highlight a little bit on the postdoc phase of your life definitely definitely uh, I guess would I ever do a postdoc again not if I didn't have to um, Postdocing was a really diff difficult period of my life, as most people can probably appreciate here. But it did help me get to where I am. So how I leveraged my postdoc experience. I was lecturing as a postdoc, and I was very fortunate to be on a research project that was quickly moving into clinical trial. And we were receiving a lot of press about it which meant I got to dedicate quite a bit of my time to interacting with the media, uh, doing TV and radio interviews, but then also doing a lecture series in the public, discussing our work and you know, getting interest in our project and in our research. And all of that was really beneficial to giving me the experience to further develop my graphic skills, my presentation skills, and get extremely well practiced in communicating with a variety of different audiences. And from then on, I had really been running two careers side by side. So doing my, my bench work by the day and doing my communication by night and on the weekends. And when this job came up, I've, I continually put in uh, regular uh, keyword searches when just looking for jobs and looking for my next step. And this was the first time that I'd seen a communications role that had specifically asked for a PhD scientist and was not for manuscript writing. And I was really excited by that because one of my true loves is public speaking and graphic design. And here was a position in the city that I was in that was going to offer me the opportunity to do that. Now, having a postdoc doesn't necessarily help my current role um, I don't need it as much uh, for what I do now, other than the fact that it gives me a really good foot in the door when interacting with our top tier faculty. For my first year here, uh, I usually had to start every single conversation with a list of my credentials uh, just to make sure that our faculty would speak to me uh, in an appropriate manner, meaning that they could talk nerdy to me and I would understand uh, what they wanted to discuss. And now that I've been here and I've been working with some of these faculty members, they're starting to realize more and more how useful it is to have really good visual and graphic representation of their data when they're speaking to these different audiences. Uh, it's taken about a year to, to solidify some of those relationships, but now I think that people, uh, at least here, are, are starting to come around and really seeking me out now and uh, offering me ability to I guess, help them uh, communicate better, which is quite fun. I really like that. Um, one of the things that I often get asked uh, by a lot of people is, uh, in, in true scientist way, are just asking for, give me the one, two, threes. What do I need to do? Uh, what color do I use? What font do I use? How many slides? And there's always a series of questions. And, um, too often that quest, the, the answers are a little ambiguous. So one of the things I'd really like to do is walk through some of those um, different uh, tools that I use with our staff here to kind of get them uh, show ready, so to say. And, and a lot of these tools can be used no matter what kind of audience you're interacting with, whether it's a lay audience or colleagues or at a big conference seminar. Uh, these are just some of the preparation tools that I personally use. And honestly, the first time you do it, it's going to take a little bit of time. But the more you practice and the more you prepare, the easier and the faster it gets. So um, let's see, where am I? Um, one of the things I like to do when I start out is ask a lot of questions. And this happens before the presentation and during the presentation and after the presentation. So in the preparation period, I like to find out as much as I possibly can about the audience and the environment that I'm going to be walking into. And this is really important uh, depending on how you want to tailor your presentation. 
And you need to be quite cognizant of the audience that you're speaking to and their potential learning style and the diversity, not only of the background experiences, but also the diversity of their learning styles. So adults have uh, distinct learning styles compared to children or teenagers. And it's really important that you are aware of those when you're putting together a presentation and what that environment is going to allow you to work within. So if you're in a seminar hall and you have 500 people in front of you versus a boardroom with maybe six people in front of those, those experiences in that environment are going to be a little bit different. And so I like to start by asking a lot of questions of the um, event organizer, uh, knowing the lay of the land, going and visiting the room beforehand, and trying to imagine what some of those roadblocks might be uh, that I might have to anticipate while putting my presentation together. I also like to consider uh, a lot about the, the audience because you need to start making some assumptions about how you're going to communicate with them, uh, even if you're talking to other scientists. So I'm a card-carrying uh, immunologist, and even though I hate to admit it, um, I am. And even though I, I do study immunology and I love flow cytometry. Reading flow plots on a presentation is really difficult. And this is propensity to put 14 different plots up there. And even though you may understand it and, and be able to pull away a take-home point quite quickly, a colleague who may be just as qualified as you but doesn't work with flow cytometry may not be able to automatically find that same message. And so even if you're speaking to colleagues, you should be aware of their background experience and whether or not there's someone who reads a flow plot you know, eight hours a day, every day out of the week. And you may choose to uh, change how you communicate the results of that particular experiment to that group. Uh, and, and you can do this by uh, by making some assumptions before you walk into your prepper in, into your presentation. But one trick I've learned along the way is that you can also do this uh, at the beginning or during your presentation. And it takes a little bit of practice because you're going to be tailoring your message on the fly. And um, this also comes back, this kind of loops back into adult learning behaviors. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that we can take in information. So we can read it, we can hear it, or we can uh, do something like an active learner. And it's going to take, you're going to have all of these people in your audience. And one thing I found is that active learning is a really good way to connect with your audience and keep them engaged in what you're saying. Uh, studies have found that if, uh, if people are in a, at a table and they have something to fidget with, they're actually going to take in more information. So when you're giving a presentation, one thing I like to do is just do a quick uh, show of hands or a quick poll right at the beginning to get people doing even simple movements. And doing that is going to make sure that they're more engaged with your communication and more engaged with your story right off the bat. And as you're starting to ask these questions and formulate your, your presentation, it's really important to kind of go back and connect with your, your light bulb moment. What is, you know, I told you about how I discovered DNA for the first time. You know, try and identify that light bulb moment that you had and, and where does that passion really come from? And you want to be able to connect your passion with your story. Now, the other great thing about identifying that, that story of, of where that light bulb moment came from is that if you pull it apart, you're probably going to find that that moment was really simple. It was a really basic exploration or a really basic question that was answered. And in doing so, it kind of helps remind you that the audience that you're interacting with, you know, when was the last time that they had a biology course? When was the last time they had studied flow cytometry? And it, I think it helps you kind of take your story back to those original building blocks. And it's also really good to incorporate your enthusiasm into your talk. And so you want to marry you know, what your passion is with your take-home point and putting the two of those together. 
because when you're excited, your audience is going to be excited, and that's another really great way to keep your people engaged with the story that you're telling. And also, as you're going through and preparing and planning to talk, it's important to keep sight of what is that take-home point? What is the one thing that you want your audience to walk away with? Because 95% of what you say is going to be lost on them. So when they're walking back to their lab, when they're driving back home, what is the one thing you want them to remember about what you said? And from there, you can build your story. So I like to use concept maps when I'm starting from scratch. And again, you're talking about that core story. What is that one thing you want people to take away from them? And then you kind of go around in this, this circle. So you want to clarify the goal. Do you want to call them to action? Do you want them to validate your research? Do you want them to provide you funding? Um, you want to find what that common ground is between you and your audience so that you can find better ways of engaging with them. And jargon is really important. So no matter who you're talking to, you're going to be using some degree of jargon that your audience is not familiar with. Even if you're working at your own lab meeting, and if you're in a reasonably sized team, not everybody on that team is going to be 100% familiar with everything that you do on a daily basis. And they may not use the same acronyms or the same software. And so you need to be aware of who you're communicating with and that you might be using some terms that aren't at the forefront of their brain. Uh, and another way to get around this is to use useful analogies and also visuals. And so my background is really in visuals and graphic, and that's uh, where I'd like to go with that. So when you're starting this to develop your story and what your core message is, one thing that can really help your presentation is a bit of a roadmap, so especially when you're talking with adults and adult learners. Uh, letting them know where you intend to go and then kind of reminding them along the way is a really good tool to keep them uh, on path with you. And I'm often asked how many slides or, um, you know, what's too much for this time or this type of talk. And the, the, question, the answer to that is that there's no real rule of thumb because everybody spends a different amount of time on slides. And so it really comes down to practicing and knowing what kind of message you want to use on a given slide and making sure that you don't overwhelm anybody with too much information on any one slide. Uh, there's a real, a real desire sometimes to just cut and paste um, titles or uh, pictures of publications or uh, figures from papers and put, you know, your 26 flow plots up there. And the thing is, is that reading, listening, and watching are all very different tasks, and they're going to mentally tax your audience. So you want to be very specific about what you want them to take away. And when you put too much information on a slide, you run the risk that your audience is going to spend all of their energy trying to read and understand every last letter on that slide instead of listening to you. And you really want them to listen to you, and so your visuals and your slides should be more of a compliment or something that's going to facilitate or help you. Uh, it shouldn't detract from what you're actually discussing. Uh, the other thing is font choice. Uh, one of my pet peeves, and I don't know where this came from, uh, maybe from a PhD comic back in the day, uh, is that classic blue background with a yellow font. Uh, and I can't, I can't figure out uh, where this came from, but I've had so many PIs over the years that did every presentation with a blue background and a yellow font. And um, it's really hard for the eye to look at that color combination. And similarly, you should look at choosing colors and fonts that are agreeable and easy to read. So I've just put up here a couple of different examples of different fonts that are great standard go-tos and some that tend to be on the more distracting side. So you don't want to do an entire deck that is all in Comic Sans or a chiller font because it's going to be really hard to read. And also, uh, size matters. 
And a great thing to do is to go through your decks and make sure that you're consistent with your font sizes from deck to deck or from slide to slide. And just a really good rule of thumb is that anything under a four-point font is going to be completely unreadable to anybody in your audience when projected. Um, if your slide is going to be turned into a PDF and a handout, that's a different story. But if, if you're using a projector in any format, anything under size 14 is not legible. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, just some basics about how to get started. And the other thing that can really help you with uh, putting your presentation together is being aware of um, analogies and similes and metaphors that might be useful to help you convey some of those messages. And this is where knowing your audience comes into play as well, because you want to choose an analogy that is appropriate for your audience. So for me and in my experience, I, I often have uh, groups of uh, benefactors that are uh, older or retired, and then I also have groups that happen to be young parents or in their uh, mid-20s, early 30s. And the same analogies don't often work for these two people. So if I'm going to be talking about the genome and the gene and the DNA, you know, one of those classic analogies that we've heard so much is, you know, your genome is like the cookbook, a gene is a recipe, and the DNA are the individual words in the recipe. Now, if you're a young parent uh, and somebody who's a little bit younger, you know, something that might be more common to you is looking up a recipe on your phone, or you might have an app for that. So, you know, an analogy for genes and genomes uh, that's more appropriate for that demographic might be something like cloud storage is your genome, and the app is a gene, and the code to make that app is the DNA. So trying to go through and actually pull these apart and, and find how they connect with your audience is really important. And the last part that I really wanted to uh, leave people with is uh, this idea of translating complex ideas visually because this is one of the main things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And like I said, it's really common for scientists to go in and work on their talk the night before or on the plane to the talk or in the audience before they go and give their presentation. And because it's fast and it's easy, it's um, quite common to see people just cut and paste figures from their publication. Now, the problem with this is that the publication has a completely different audience in mind, uh, where the audience is going to be spending more time looking at the details, and they're probably going to have this in paper format, and they're going to be focused on it. Uh, in a presentation mode, you don't want your audience to be putting all that energy trying to understand what the take-home point is. So it's important for you to provide that point for them. So as you see on this slide, there's a lot of stuff going on, and you're trying to squeeze all these different uh, graphical representations into the format of a publication, whereas there may only be one event in that entire figure that you're going to discuss. And so that's what you really want to pull out and make sure that people are actually looking at the parts that you want them to look at. And there's a lot of other ways that you can do this and play around with it. So I used to work in drug discovery, and we were trying to develop small molecules that would fit into a binding uh, pocket. And most of the people that I worked with were straight immunologists, and so it didn't really work with molecules on that level. And so going and discussing all these different protein folding uh, events and all these different molecular structures didn't always resonate with my colleagues. And here I have an example of um, a child's toy. Now, I didn't use this to actually talk with my colleagues about, but when I went into the public and tried to uh, educate my community members, I usually start with um, this plastic toy because it was a common ground. If they were uh, a parent or uh, similarly aged, almost everybody could visualize and recognize this toy from their childhood or from their environment. And it was a really good starting ground to start that discussion about how we're looking for drugs that fit into a specific size target. Uh, so it's really great idea to ask questions of your audience and really try to identify what that common starting point is for all of you, and then you can build from there. 
but you're going to generally have to take them on that journey with you. Um, and at the bottom is uh, another a microarray. So microarrays like flow plots are really hard to read and understand instantly. And unless you're staring at this one plot every single day, day in and day out, you're not going to understand what the take home point is. And so if you're going to represent data like this, it's really important that you drill down and show people what it is that you exactly want them to be focusing at and make that take home point for them. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to just practice. Um, if you can identify your passion and what you're excited about and connect that to the story that you want to tell, your audience is going to be so much more engaged in what you're actually saying. You want to be very careful to define the major takeaway messages that you want them to walk away with and 100% consider your audience, your shared experiences, and the type of environment that they're going to be in and that you're going to be interacting with. And be thoughtful about your images and your data and your details. Make sure that you're always asking questions and practice, because the more you practice, the easier it's going to get. And, and with that, I think um, Joanne Doreen uh, said that these slides uh, may be made into a PDF. And I also wanted to offer that I have uh, concept maps and worksheets that are available that I can also make available that helps uh, our scientists kind of go through a step-by-step -step process in how they start to formulate some of these presentations. And it helps you um, kind of put a structure to your story uh, if you're starting from scratch. And with that, I know that's a bit early, but do you guys have any questions or did anybody want to hear anything specifically? I'll let, I'll let everybody chime in. Hi, this is Joanne. Thank you very much. We have a nice comment that says those resources would be very helpful. And what we'll do um, is, uh, for those people that I have emails for, I'll be happy to send a PDF out, and I can send it to Doreen, of course. Does anyone who has a microphone have a desire to uh, actually speak? Um, jo uh, Laura, I have a question for you. Um, so oh, I use PowerPoint and I love it, but um, I'm, I, uh, I'm starting to hear about other tools like Keynote. So in your experience, um, what do you usually prefer when you're making PowerPoint presentations? That's a great question. So I primarily use PowerPoint at the moment, and that's really born out of being a, a poor graduate student that couldn't afford anything else. Uh, but I also do work in the Adobe Creative Suites. So Keynote is great, uh, but it also depends on what the major, um, the major supported program is at your institution. So here, almost all of our lecture theaters are on PC. And so I try to develop everything on PC, uh, but I do have the flexibility to go through Keynote. Um, the thing with Keynote or um, Prezi, and, and also you can do it in PowerPoint as well, but it's more important in Prezi and Keynote is that they have some really amazing animations, uh, but they can be very distracting if used inappropriately. Uh, and sometimes they can, like Prezi, it kind of goes back and forth and can make you a little bit motion sickness. Uh, so, I like to stay in PowerPoint and just to keep the transitions between images uh, quite simple. And I think uh, at least my style is to use simple lines and uh, simple visuals. Now, you can, um, you can use uh, Creative Suites. I use Adobe to develop some of my graphics. And there's also free programs that are gaining a lot of traction, like Inkscape. They're really, really handy and really useful, uh, especially if you can't afford to, to get a creative suite. But at the end of the day, I'm putting everything into a PowerPoint presentation. The other thing, uh, the difference between me and our graphic artists, is that our scientists um, really like to reuse a lot of these things, so I try to make graphics and visuals that are changeable because when new results come out, they want to be able to alter it and not have to go back and design something from scratch. And so that's another thing that I try to be aware of when I'm developing these for our faculty. 
Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I was also wondering if you can uh, talk a little bit about giving an oral talk, because your TED Talk was amazing, and I'm sure you must, one key is that, yes, you practice a lot. But any anything about um, body language or any tricks up your sleeve that you use? Um, like for example, for me, I always, before I start a talk, I take a, a, a minute of, I just, you know, look at the audience and try to gauge, and I'm like, okay, I just give myself a pep talk in my head, and I'm like, all right, Doreen, you got this, you can go give this talk. And most of the time, these talks have been, uh, the talks that I've given are my own material, uh, which is usually my own research, so I've been pretty confident. But if you have any other um, things that you have shared with other scientific re scientists on how to uh, be, how to give a good oral presentation. Definitely. So we we have to talk and orally communicate our science on a daily basis. It's just a fact of life. And when I walk into a presentation, regardless of the size, I like to treat that just as any informal conversation about my science. Uh, if you've run into somebody in the hallway or uh, someone at coffee, and, and usually that's my biggest um, point of advice for somebody who may be nervous or a little apprehensive about stepping out on stage. I, I like to make eye contact with my audience and just treat it like we're sitting in a living room and we're going to have a discussion. And one of the tricks that I use to kind of calm myself uh, and also make sure that I have that connection is, like I said, at the beginning of a presentation, I try to do a quick show of hands, a really simple yes or no, uh, and quick questions just to get people to start interacting with me. And it kind of breaks down that informal barrier uh, that you might perceive you have between yourself and whoever is sitting in the front row. And also, the, that interaction and that question action, uh, it not only breaks the barrier, gets them engaged, but you can also use it as a tool if you need to buy yourself some time to think about a response. So if somebody asks you a question that may throw you off, you can either repeat it back to them or ask them another question. And in the act of doing that, it's actually buying you some time to take a deep breath consider what your response, and then act on it. And that's what I do. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. That, that was really helpful. Um, the last question I have for you is because I'm always interested in career development. Um, we have uh, these days is we, we come across a lot of uh, firms which are involved in medical communication. But I was wondering if you have, because uh, you've been in this position for a year now, if you've seen other uh, foundations like Fred Hutch or other institutions uh, starting to open up positions like yourself where someone would be, a, a PhD would be able to uh, liaise between the scientific community and the, um, the, out, the uh, outside world. Yeah, so what I hear quite often about this role is that a lot of companies, a lot of firms are incredibly excited about it and a lot of people see the utility of it. There just aren't um, there isn't a job title yet that, that completely defines my role. So I'm really, um, I think I'm optimistic that the, the time is changing and that we're going to start seeing more and more of these roles around there. And I think people are already doing these sorts of things, but they, they're probably bunched in with other types of jobs. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get involved in science communication uh, in, in a variety of different platforms. So just here at Fred Hutch, uh, there's a handful of ways that we interact with our faculty. So mine is philanthropy focused. So I'm primarily looking for people that are going to tell an engaging story and uh, tug at the heartstrings, so to say, to uh, garner private support. We also have faculty here that fall more into business development and they're trying to uh, garner the support of investors or corporations to partner with our scientists. So there's a lot of science communication that goes into that. And that's really interesting because they're primarily interacting with a lay audience. Uh, so you need to give them a platform of the background biology to get started with, but they're going to take those materials and hand them off to their experts. So you're always trying to find this fine balance between too simplified and too detailed. Uh, we also do a lot of 
scientific outreach in our community. So we host community events where we bring uh, science speakers, science activities. For example, we have a major fundraising bike race coming up and one of my roles is to develop a hands-on experience for about 3,000 people that are at an outdoor concert. And so now we're talking about how can we teach them about blood cancer in this kind of environment? And uh, hopefully, if everything goes right, we, we might be uh, doing a big tent with um, an adult-sized ball pit to play in. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of to work on this communication. Um, medical affairs is a huge area, and that can be in terms of taking a product line and communicating that to patient groups, investor groups, peer-to-peer, uh, uh, -peer, so physician-to-physician. -to -physician. There's also science communication and healthcare communications through agencies. So a lot of these biotech firms can't afford to have people in-house, so they hire agencies to work on this as well. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways. And I think uh, the advice that I had for early on is identify what your target audience is. So who is it that you want to interact with the most? and then go from there. So for me, it's lay audience. I love breaking these things down in the most simplest ways, so that's how I landed here.